I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you not just survive, but thrive through the reset that's already begun. And I'm very excited today because here's somebody else that can help you do that, my friend Jason Hartman. Now he is the founder and CEO of Platinum Properties Investor Network and a specialist in real estate, which is something that all of my viewers are interested in. But considering everything that's happening in the real estate market, from moratoriums to evictions, to cancellations, to sky high prices, we have a lot to talk about today. In addition, his podcasts and YouTube videos, and, and you have all of the links below and also on our blog. He's a very popular keynote speaker. He was with me at George Gammon's wonderful Rebel Capitalist event in June, and we had a lot of fun. So thank you so much for coming today, Jason. Well, Lynette, the pleasure is all mine. It's great to be back on with you. And I, I, I always love our talks. Uh, you know, uh, years ago, people would have considered some of this stuff out there, but I think the <laughs> population is waking up and um, so you just don't know who you can trust anymore. And, uh, uh, the, you know, there's an old saying that I'm, I'm sure you've heard and I'm sure many of your viewers have heard too. Um, if you don't have your own plan, you will be part of somebody else's plan. And uh, you know that's what's wonderful about the work you're doing is you're trying to help people uh, stay with their own plan for their life, which is a much better plan than somebody else's plan. <laughs> oh, I guarantee you. I mean, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Oh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> that is the plan. It is, it is actually really scary and programmable money too. I mean, yeah. you know, that they can dictate everything that we're doing in this lovely surveillance economy. Yeah. yeah. But no, it's... It's uh, it's they we are nearing a point of what I'll call checkmate. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I, uh, you know, I was studying how there was this movement to have a global fiat currency. Uh, you know, they were talking about a North American currency like the Amero. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and now that we have had the you know, the advent of Bitcoin around 12, 13 years ago and all the cryptocurrencies. Now they, they've gotten so much smarter. Right. Because they know that with a digital uh, with a central bank digital currency, they will exercise so much control over everybody's life, whether it be social scoring, whether it be lockdowns, whether it be what you can spend your money on, what you can't spend it on, how quickly that money in your phone, probably it'll be in your phone, will expire. Will it go down in value? Can you spend it more than a mile from your home? What if they want you to stay in your own area? I mean, it is, it's getting pretty, pretty scary out there. Yeah, you're right. And I, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. And it just points to the importance of really having physical gold and silver completely outside of the system, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to maintain your independence, yeah. along with the food, water, energy, security, and then community and shelter. Right. So, yeah. and there's a lot um, you know, I, I think the shift started in 2008 to corporate America really owning and controlling the mom and pops. Can you talk really more about that and give us an overview of where you think we are right now? Yeah, you know, in, uh, in some ways, it's an amazing time to be alive. You know, we have all this great technology uh, and, and for a while we had a free internet. Of course, that's changed, sadly. Uh, especially after January. Um, and uh, now the gloves are off. Everybody knows that they are censoring everything, that they're controlling the narrative, that we're just not going to get the truth anywhere except places like this while they last because mm -hmm. they're censoring us too and deplatforming people and all kinds of things. Uh, so, um, you know, when you asked about corporate America though, uh, you know, we're, we're really in this environment, Lynette, where it's a, a winner take all society. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being um, a, a more flattened environment where the power and the capital uh, and the businesses are in the hands of small businesses, of mom and pop entrepreneurs, which are really the backbone of America and the back backbone of any great society, uh, it's all sort of coalesced 
into uh, a small number of corporate giants. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all know about the big tech companies and uh, the, the other big companies. But even with something as simple as coffee, you know, try finding a coffee shop that's not that doesn't start with an S. You right. know, uh, and and the 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 poison that that company Starbucks is foisting onto society is just ridiculous. So the stuff they sell causes uh, diabetes. It's full of pesticides. It's full of sugar. It's awful. Uh, and uh, there's just really no other practical, reasonable choice anymore because they've just, you know, the the way capital is formed in this country, it lends itself to this winner take all type of situation, and uh, that is very disconcerting. Yeah, it sure is. And that's that's the importance of being as self-sufficient and independent as possible. Yep. You know, so I, I don't personally go to Starbucks myself, but um, yeah, I think we we vote with our purse. I mean, yep. that's how that's how you vote. And if you support these guys that are taking over and Amazon really did. That was the start of the death knell for the mom and pops because they oh, didn't have sure. to make money. They didn't have to make profits. All and, and Lynette, there's the flip side of that equation. You're absolutely right uh, because Amazon could do illogical things just like Uber and Lyft do. They, they run businesses at a loss uh, by raising money. I mean, look, at raising money is not a business. Businesses actually sell uh, products and services and mark them up. That's right. a business. That's okay? a business. You know, yeah. Uh, raising money is not a business. Okay, that's a that's a Ponzi scheme essentially. Uh, so, um, you know, Amazon is not only putting the mom and pop businesses and retailers out of business, but they're also destroying the lives of workers. Yeah. And uh, you 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 know, we all have read about the abuses, the terrible abuses, and uh, absolute sort of iron thumb control that uh, they exert in those warehouses on people. They have uh, sensors that sense carbon dioxide, in other words, exhaling, because when those sensors are triggered, they can tell people are talking too much amongst <laughs> themselves. They promote a diversity agenda, which, you know, on its face we think is good, but what really happens, and the reason the corporatocracy is promoting this diversity agenda, is because it uh, it splits people up into clans, okay? And uh, we you know we all have seen that with BLM and the riots and all of this stuff, right? And every, you know just look at social media; everybody's arguing and fighting, and um, it makes them much much less likely to unionize, right? And uh, and and gain some sense. rights against the employer, against the, uh, you know, this is just uh, these are the these are not capitalists, okay? These are the robber barons of our time. They are the new Carnegies, Mellons, Rockefellers, and uh, and they're just totally and Vanderbilts. They're just totally abusive. Okay, they're they're abusing the workers. Um, they're they're usually not abusing the customers. They're usually kind of customer centric, and since most of the audience is the customer, uh, you know they they please the customer right by offering cheap products, uh, mostly imported from China. Yeah, right, and uh, yeah. So you, you, you know, I probably don't have to rant too much more about it. <laughs> well, no, but, you know, we want to hear what the viewers want to ha hear as well, what we're having in this conversation, because the only way to really protect ourselves is to come together as a community, because yep. there are a lot more of us than there are of them. And a lot of what's happened over the last year and a half has consolidated that power. Sure has. And they know that people will always default to convenience and price. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they that's how they woo us in. Uh, that's how the big uh, companies are just they, they've been just stealing all our data. Uh, it's you know, there's an old song. I think it's by Bob Seger. You remember it. You know, I'm not just a number. Right. You're all mm -hmm. just a number now. Uh, oh, they have wow. thousands yes. of data points on each person. Uh, they have massively abused their privileges. They've invaded our privacy. They've sold our data. Um, remember, when the product is cheap or free, you are the product. Right. Uh, so be, be really careful of that. You know, back to your point, though, earlier, Lynette, about um, being self-sufficient. And you have done just a great job Thank at you. that. Uh, and I'm you know, not sure as good as I'd like it to be. I still have right. a ways to go, but I'm working. I've been working well, on it for a long time. Well, we all do, because as humans, you know, that really is our strength to be not independent, but interdependent. Mm -hmm. The problem is the the 
version of interdependency we have now is uh, giant corporations and government to individual people, right? Right. Who are who have been fragmented up into clans, and uh, so um, what what we what we've got to remember is that the government in times of crisis, and we do have a desperate government, and most governments mm -hmm. around the world are quite desperate, not mm -hmm. just the United States. So this is not just a U.S. thing. Right. Uh, for my podcast, I've got listeners in 189 countries. I'm sure you're about right. the same. Right. Yeah. All yeah. over the world. And. and Every government is basically over indebted. Uh, they're producing fiat currency. That's their main product is the currency they produce. That's the, any government's and central bank's primary product, their widget, if you will, is the dollar, the yen, the euro, the Brazilian real, the peso, whatever, right? That's their product. And they must get us to keep consuming that product because with that product, they control so much of our lives. And once right. that product becomes digital, they will control dramatically more with vaccine passports, you know, the oh, whole- the that's whole already issue. started too. Yeah, I, mean. I know, I know. Yeah, New York. Uh, so, you know, the governments though always look for the low hanging fruit. And you mentioned gold and silver. Of course, that's a good insurance policy. That's your business. There are other pieces of low hanging fruit uh, out there. And one is real estate. And that's my business. And I, I love income property. I think it's the, the most historically proven asset class in the world. It's more of an investment than an insurance policy like gold and silver. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to confiscate it. Yes, they are doing things around the edges. There's no question. And we can talk about moratoriums as well. But, you know, it's really easy when the government is in dire straits to go take all of the uh, retirement plans, the 401ks and the IRAs, and all that money in those plans is basically in brokerage accounts. Right. And they, they can just make an edict, uh, you know, even an executive order possibly, that says just, you know, look at, they'll, they'll engineer a crisis or take advantage of a crisis that, that they might be even be complicit in, right. uh, or they'll just, a crisis will just happen. And then for our own protection, the government will have to step in. And of course, who's gonna administrate that? A big tech company, along with the government. They're of course in bed together. And uh, when they do that, uh, they will retitle those accounts to the government, and then they will just inflate the value of them away so that you might get your, your government stipend, your stimulus in nominal dollars, but in real dollars, it's almost meaningless. And, and listen, you don't have to believe me. It's already been happening for decades. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, I mean, Poland did that uh, right after 2008 and they went in and they took, I think it was 50% of everything that was in the private retirement plans. And even our government, and I haven't looked at this in a little while, so I should go in and see the chatter because there's a lot of chatter coming up around pension plans again. But they discussed having an 11, I think it was 11.47 one off event. Because if you only think they're going to do it once, then you don't change behavior. So yeah. the way they're going to position it is we're only going to do this once. And it is, again, you know, for your protection. Yeah. But what about real estate taxes? Uh, that, well, the nice thing about real estate taxes is they are very fragmented among uh, over 3,100 counties in the United States. So that's pretty hard to coordinate. Now at the federal level, uh, uh, Sleepy Joe Biden uh, wants to uh, uh, reduce the, val the opportunity for investors to use the 1031 tax deferred exchange. Mm -hmm. Who knows if he'll get that through, but he wants to limit the uh, deferral benefit on that. When people sell properties, they can buy other investment properties and trade them all their life tax-free. It's a fantastic deal. Income property, at least currently, is the most tax-favored asset class in America. Uh, and um, he wants to limit that to $500,000 per year. But you know, Lynette, I think he's gonna have a pretty hard time making that happen because the big giant corporations exactly. are in the uh, real estate business in a big way. They're now in the single family home business in a big way, but before they've always been in the apartment complex business, the right. retail shopping center business, the office space business, but now they're doing single family homes by the tens of thousands, invitation homes, for example, right. and American homes for rent, yeah. 
And so, uh, you know, we've heard from the World Economic Forum, you will own nothing and be happy. So that's certainly part of it is where you live, right? And no so then the, these big corporations can then dictate how much you're going to pay. And if everything's yep. digital, it's easy enough for them to take it out. It so. sure is. It sure is. And so we'll see where that goes. But as far as the big companies in the single family home business, mm -hmm. uh, that number is definitely increasing. But in the in terms in relation to the overall market size, it is like a drop in a bucket. It's nothing yet. I, I it is increasing. But so far, it's still a very, very small number. There's approximately 18 million uh, single family rental homes in the country owned by mom and pop investors. And, uh, you know, the number owned by institutions is really a very small number. It is growing, though. So it's something to keep an eye on. Well, and I've read a lot of documents when you're talking about the mom and pops. Of course, we've had the rent moratoriums that came in, but the costs the taxes, the insurance, those other things keep going on. And so mom and pops, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, you know this area better than I do, but you know the mom and pops are getting squeezed out. And you're also looking at prices, nominal prices of these properties at you know insane levels again, which corporations don't really care because they're borrowing that money for zero and then basically turning around and taking that debt and turning it into a Wall Street product and selling off the risk. Right, yeah. Is that what you're seeing? That is what we're seeing, but again, it's not that big a deal yet, however it is increasing. As far as the moratoriums, uh, I was commenting on that, interestingly, on Monday yes. night on RT News, as we talked about, mm -hmm. and then literally the next day after, after I was talking on the news about how they were ending the moratoriums, they put them back into effect uh, through the CDC now. Did anybody ever imagine that the Center for Disease Control would be dictating <laughs> rental housing policy Oh, I couldn't have imagined that. <laughs> Honestly, I couldn't have. It's kind of insane. I'm dumbfounded, you know? <laughs> right. These, these, these are crazy times. They really are. So, again, they, they're, they're doing things away. You know, basically what's happening in so many ways in our life, not just with rental housing, just in ev they're doing it from every angle you can imagine. It's a taking, okay? Right. It's a taking. It's a wealth transfer. It's a... It's a it's a cent it's a wealth transfer it's a it's a centralization of power and control um, all of these things are very worrisome yeah they really are but do you think you know with the scarcity of properties on the market do you think that the corporations going in and buying big tracts of home it's you know i mean isn't it making it almost impossible especially for a first time home buyer and that uh, percentage of mortgage debt is really, you know, the mortgage boom is driving debt levels for individuals that are buying their own homes to new heights. Yeah, that's sort of a complicated issue because you really have a lot of layers to peel back on that mm -hmm. onion, if you will. Um, it, it seems like housing prices are high. However, I would argue that they're not very high in comparison to many commodities. Now, I think the first one we should maybe talk about is gold. It's gold, and you uh, have so, a great table yeah, on that. I do, and it's on the screen for your viewers. Uh, you've probably published this in audio format too, so I'll just explain it as well for anybody who's not watching. Please. But uh, what's really interesting here, Lynette, is to see how powerful gold has been as an insurance policy uh, to maintain purchasing power over decades. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, the big change happened in the 1970s, and the 1970s was a really interesting decade for economists. <laughs> it wasn't, it <laughs> yes, wasn't, it was. It wasn't a good one, but it's a really interesting one to study because a lot happened. First of all, of course, as all your uh, audience knows, Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971 and ended the last vestige of convertibility from the dollar to gold. And that meant that the government really had no tether anymore. They could mm -hmm. do whatever they wanted in terms of their irresponsible spending. 
Uh, you know, my favorite president of my lifetime was Ronald Reagan, and he had this great quote. He, he, he used to say, uh, you know, to say that the government spends like a drunken sailor is an insult to drunken sailors. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and so as the government has racked up the debt, it has created a lot of inflationary pressure in the system. And the 70s and the early 80s were the worst of that until our Fe former Fed chair Paul Volcker came along and broke the back of inflation by just tightening the money supply to levels never seen before. Mm -hmm. But he had the guts to do it, and I got to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, so if you go back to 1970, the year before Nixon took us off the gold standard, gold, as you know, was $35 an ounce. Mm -hmm. The median home price back then was just over $22,000. So if you wanted to buy the median price home in gold, it would cost 646 ounces of gold, okay? Now, the problem we get into when people try to evaluate what anything is worth is they only use one measuring stick. They only compare it to one thing. And that's a huge mistake. They compare it to just dollars. Right. Why would, why would we just use dollars? That's crazy. Nobody cares about dollars. They only care about what dollars buy them. That's, that's, and that's actually what really matters. That's what really buy. matters. Mm -hmm. And so an ounce of gold will buy you a lot more and it hasn't been debased like the dollar has. So, you know, in 1970, 646 ounces of gold to buy the median price house. Um, jumping to today, uh, if you want to buy the median price house today in dollars, you're, you're thinking that's $350,000 almost. That's a lot of money. But the fallacy is you're only measuring in dollars, right? right. If you measure in gold, mm -hmm. it's only 194 ounces of gold. So guess what? Your purchasing power of a house versus a dollar versus gold has been a winner if, you, if you're buying it in gold. And everybody listening and watching needs to understand that when they earn their money, when they earn their income, they're not forced to keep their income stored, or well, the part that they save, hopefully, right? right? They're not forced to keep that in dollars. Exactly. They could store that wealth in oil, gold, rice, orange juice, <laughs> a whole host of things, Bitcoin, uh, you know, just a silver, uh, platinum, palladium. You know, there, there's just a myriad of things that you can use other than the dollar. Right. And many of these things withstand uh, or hedge inflation much better than the dollar does. Well, the so, dollar doesn't. Yeah, no, it doesn't. The, the dollar it doesn't, doesn't at all. all. Yeah. Yeah, so that's for sure. So, so priced in gold, houses have gotten a lot cheaper over the years, cheaper than they were actually 51 years ago. Yet right. everybody thinks they're so expensive because they're only measuring in dollars. Well, um, I know what I think, but I'm going to ask you what you think. Do you think this trend is going to continue and maybe even escalate? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I really got into this comparison thing um, over the last few years. Uh, I always say to my audience, Lynette, maybe for the past, I don't know, six or seven years, compared to what? I always ask right. that question. And they've dubbed it the Jason Hartman question, compared to what? Now, clearly I did not invent the question, okay? <laughs> um, but um, as I started thinking about it, I thought, you know, I should develop an index, an economic index, a housing index, that would measure the price of real estate versus a whole bunch of commodities that we all need to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, in so doing, I created the HCI, the Hartman Comparison Index, and it measures 70 different commodities now. Okay, that's how big the index is currently. And some commodities, uh, you know, priced in some things, houses have become more expensive, and in others, they've become less expensive. And I'm happy to share more examples than just gold, if you like. Sure. I think everybody would be interested in seeing that. Good, good, good stuff. So, good um, stuff. you know, so, so pr the question is priced in gold is real estate cheap or expensive? It's very cheap. It's less than one third of what it cost 51 years ago, two generations ago. Um, priced in Bitcoin, we can't go back very far, but right. it's much cheaper priced in Bitcoin. Okay. So we'll just leave that one. But 
I think, you know, Bitcoin's highly speculative, right? The cryptocurrencies are very risky. You know, they, they fluctuate like crazy, uh, as we all know. Um, but I think a good one to use is oil, because mm -hmm. oil, no matter what anybody says, is arguably the most important commodity in the entire world. Forget about what the green greenies say. The world runs on oil, folks. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not changing know, that quickly. It's not changing anytime it's not changing soon. Changing that quickly. And what's interesting, Lynette, is you know if anybody remembers back to the seventies again, I remember do. all this fear of peak oil, mm -hmm. right? There was all this talk, and you can look up peak oil that phrase in Wikipedia and read about it to understand it. They thought the world would run out of oil, but what they didn't count on was that. Humans being very innovative, they invented new technologies to get more oil, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, we use that now and oil, uh, you know, has, has become cheaper in some cases. But the world runs on oil. I would say it is the most important commodity, uh, you know, on earth uh, at, at, after, of course, you know, oxygen and water. <laughs> okay, but we're not pricing that. Right. So in 1970, if you wanted to go back and buy that median price house, it would cost you 6,746 barrels, and a barrel is about 55 gallons, barrels of oil. So almost 7,000 barrels of oil to buy a house 51 years ago. Um, if you fast forward that uh, to uh, just 10 years, 10 years after that in 1980, it only cost 2,043 barrels of oil to buy a house. Okay, so if you saved money in that 10 year period, denominated in oil or gold, you would have been much better 10 years later in 1980 buying a house in those commodities than in dollars. Mm -hmm. Your dollar got debased, but the commodities went up, or, mm -hmm. you know, vis a vis the dollar, right? And uh, by 2021, today, by June of this year, you and I have to look around my screen. Sorry, that's okay. Uh, 4,600 4, barrels of oil to buy a house. So, in 51 years, over five decades, it's now cheaper to buy a house priced in oil. And, and oil in 1970 was only three dollars a barrel, today it's 70 about 75 dollars a barrel. When we did this in June, mm -hmm. uh, that's our last pricing. So, priced in oil, you know, it's it's cheap, okay. So it's not cheap in everything, though. You know, I, I can go with a bunch of examples, but I don't want to bore you. But I would just say right. this. The next one is orange juice. OK, orange juice is a commodity. It's traded globally and priced in orange juice. Housing has actually become a lot more expensive. So uh, 51 years ago, it'd be 51,000 pounds of orange juice. And today it's over 280,000 pounds of orange juice to buy a house. So these things are uneven. Can I and can I ask you a question in here? I'm wondering, do you do you do this with an entire food basket, or um, do you do just the individual kind of things? Because that would be really interesting if there was a set standard food basket that most people buy. That that's a great idea, and we have priced it against a whole bunch of things. We toyed with the idea of pricing it against the CPI, but of course we all know the CPI, the consumer price index is so, such Rigged. a big lie, right. it's so, so manipulated, you know, that you can't even use it. So we've, we've looked at a lot of that stuff. There are many food items in here. Uh, there are things like haircuts in the index. Um, there, there are all sorts of things in it. You know, we've got about 70 items in it now. And overall, you know, just to bring this to a finality, mm -hmm. uh, I can say that priced in all of these things, when they are all averaged out and weighted and normalized, housing is still very cheap historically. And there's a stage two of the Hartman Comparison Index. And it is not talking about the price of the house as we have been, it's talking about the payment on the house. And with these, dysfunctionally toxic artificially low interest rates not that i have an opinion about this <laughs> <laughs> no that's why i had you on here because you have no opinions about anything <laughs> i'm a teddy bear no opinions at all absolutely um, you know uh w with those things it is super cheap when you price the mortgage payment the principal interest payment it is incredibly cheap so it makes out okay <laughs> and uh, and 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 by mm. the way i just want to state for the record i would love nothing more than to see bitcoin be the thing 
you know, a decentralized currency controlled by the people uh, rather than the central planners, I think would be awesome. I just don't know because, look, the two most powerful entities the world has ever known are governments and central banks, and they're not going to give up control easily. Right. And, and now a lot of the fintech companies and those large companies, I mean, if, if there is indeed a finite number of Bitcoin, they own a lot of them. Yeah. Hello, Elon. Do. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> and Elon goes back and forth and you see how, how uh, volatile that is, because when Elon makes a tweet, you know, he can crash the price of Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that you can really do that kind of thing with gold. It's just got, you know, when you've got a, a five millennia history, uh, you know, from Egyptian times. Right. It, you just you can't manipulate it as much. It, it has its manipulation. Well, you can with sure, the paper but, market. You know. Yeah, but, of course. And, you know, and you know, of course, GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee and, and all of that. I mean, every look at everything's manipulated. OK, yeah, it really I mean, is. There's there's some degree of manipulation in everything. But um, uh, yeah, what was your question? So, I think I got off <laughs> OK, table. sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> My concern is that that if people and I like fixed rate debt is fine oh, as yeah. long as you have the ability to pay it off in a heartbeat when you need to. Because part of the plans, as I've read from the IMF, is to have all equity and all assets, <clears throat> excuse me, held in digital form and broken down. So if you have like 300,000 in equity in your home and it's held in digital form on your phone, but broken down into dollar bills, and then they know everything about you, right? And so they know how to inspire you to spend, then you end up spending your equity. Or, or, or punish you because you wrote something bad online. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. it, it just gives them a whole lot more concern. So, sure yeah. so how do you feel about, so th for me, that's the function of gold, right? Mm -hmm. Because when they reset a currency, and you may not think the currency is going into reset, but uh, that there's, you know, do you think we're going into hyperinflation and reset? Well, I should ask you, you know, that before I make that assumption. Yeah, hyperinflation doesn't really have like an academic definition. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of like up to an opinion as to what that means, right? But uh, I, will it be Zimbabwe or Hungary or Argent, Argentina? Venezuela. <laughs> Argentina, I right? was gonna say Argentinian. Uh, style, I, I doubt it. Uh, I just think they they are they're pretty good, and I don't mean this in a positive way, but they're pretty good at running a centrally planned economy, and that's not good for us. I'm just I, saying I would that, say running a centrally planned economy into a wall. Uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> but I don't think they will run it into a wall uh, in such an intense fashion as has happened historically. They, you know, the best way to control the population is to do that slowly. I mean, it's the old thing of how do you boil a frog, right? You put them in some nice, warm, comfortable water, you turn it up slowly. That's, that's the plan. That's the best. Well, that, that's what plan. they've been doing, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and, and we'll see. And, because and so I turn think up we're at the end. A little more and a little more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, um, okay, but... Uh, so back to the question, and I'll I'll keep everybody knows what my opinion is on that. Yeah. So I'll just kind of keep that aside. The, the debt here. question, yeah. Let's. But, so let's let's, let's just focus on the question. Sure. sure. Um, when we get into dire straits, and really, like we saw in two thousand and eight with homeowners that were underwater, right? And and because the nominal prices on real estate has gone up, nobody is really underwater anymore. But if you don't have, how do you feel about having a means to boom, pay that debt off should you need to? Because I think what they'll use is that crisis to say, well, you know, okay, we're gonna restructure your mortgage and we'll waive this or that as long as you agree to hold it, the equity in digital form. You know, look, the, at the end of the day, they can do whatever they want. Right. Okay. I mean, we do have some checks and balances, but the 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 trend is certainly in the in the direction of much more control over our lives. Sadly. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, uh, but it it really goes back to the low hanging fruit. They're going to do the easiest stuff first, mm -hmm. and the the easiest thing to do is cut stimulus checks, 
uh, create inflation by incentivizing people not to work so the businesses have to compete with the government. I mean, I saw a sign uh, the other day that Dollar General is now paying $20.75 per hour to work at Dollar General with a $500 signing bonus. McDonald's is paying $500,000 signing bonuses. Mm -hmm. Basically, these businesses are all being forced to compete with the government uh, to get people to work, right? Um, and uh, as, as far as uh, that equity in your real estate, that is not low hanging fruit. That's complicated for them. Now, granted, they could get there, but it's just not going to be the place they go first. I think the oh, first place they will go yeah. is they'll go to the retirement accounts. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they'll attack that. They'll attack the cryptocurrency, the exchanges. They've already told all these exchanges, you got to know your customer just like the bank. And, you know, they're making it really difficult. Uh, they're, you know, they examine blockchains all the time. They have investigators. That's like their whole career. Uh, so they're, they're controlling all of that stuff. But when, when things are paper or digital versus physical like real estate and gold, they're, it's just much easier to control them. So that's the low-hanging fruit, you know. And, you mean and they're I think less that, easy that to control when they're physical? What's that? Did, did you mean that they're less easier con less. to control yeah. when, they're, when they're physical? Easy to control when digital and paper and hard to control when physical. I agree. Okay? But yeah. do you yeah. think that people need to be prepared to pay that debt off in the next crisis when they go after that low hang? Because there'll be different low hanging fruit in yeah. a crisis when people are freaking out, as yeah. we've seen. Yeah. It, it changes. It's dynamic. You're, you're absolutely right about that. You know, I don't think I would worry too terribly much about that. And I'll tell you why. You know, uh, having been in real estate for many decades now, uh, and having, of course, been through the last crisis, which was uh, 2008, uh, all the people who did the wrong thing got the perks and the benefits. And all the <laughs> people who did the right point. thing got screwed. Okay. And, and it also happened before that during Hurricane Katrina, and it happens in every natural disaster. Think about it. So the right thing to do, at least it used to be the right thing to do, would be to live prudently to pay for things in cash, and if you have to borrow, to pay them down quickly, uh, and delay your gratification to own your things and pay your debts, right? But the new uh, thing is, sadly, and I don't think it's right, I'm just saying it's the way it is, uh, is that if you have a high mortgage balance, and I, I always say the best insurance is a high loan balance, because during any natural disaster, Katrina, an earthquake, whatever, FEMA will come along and give either free or low interest loans uh, and other government agencies like USDA will do that too. And, um, and uh, I remember during Katrina, the attorneys general for like five of the affected states told the lenders that they had to do a mortgage payment moratorium for six months. And they, they may have even extended that, I can't remember. Well, we're in a mortgage uh, so, moratorium but, now. Well, that's a forbearance, a little different, but yes, you're right. But, but what I'm saying is, guess what happened to the people who were in the Katrina hurricane and paid their house off or had 50% equity, right? They got nothing. They got no you know, low interest, anything. They couldn't get a refi and pull cash out. It was better to have, you know, real estate is a great asset, but it's not a great bank. Um, it's better to keep your money in another asset, your wealth in that asset, like gold, for example, right? And have that because it's portable, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not very trackable, uh, it's, you know, it's, I mean, look at all these other countries like Iran, right? When people got, I, I've had a lot of Persian uh, people work for me over the years, and they all tell me stories that when they, when they had, you know, their uprising in the late 70s, right? Um, they left with the jewelry on their body right. and maybe a couple of pieces of gold in their pocket. They, they couldn't take right. their house with them. They couldn't take, maybe they took their car with them, but not for very long, okay? Right. Um, you know, you, you want to have your money in portable things. If a lender will lend you the money on the real estate, uh, but you still get to control it, even though they've put most of the money into it, that's a great deal. And it's also a way to short the dollar through what I call inflation-induced debt destruction, where you're paying the mortgage back in cheaper dollars. So uh, 
I, I, I like high loan balances on my properties. I, I think that's, I think leverage is a very powerful tool with real estate. I well, mean, it of is. course, you but have you to use it responsibly. Have, right, you know? but you also have gold. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so if push come to, came to shove and you made the choice to pay that off, especially in a reset, since that's what they reset the currency against, you would be able to pay that off. Well, I don't have enough gold to pay off all my mortgages. We need to talk. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, <laughs> we really you know, need to talk, and we need to talk about leverage, right, but we'll right, do that yeah, I don't have that much gold. I mean, I have a lot of mortgages, okay? I have a lot of properties, so. Um, but, uh, but, you know, look, um, the, the implicit option everybody has, I mean, this is the deal you all make with your lender when you borrow uh, on a mortgage. The deal you make, the loan docs you sign say this. They say you pay the mortgage or you return the collateral. That's the deal. Okay? So you can pay the mortgage or if you don't pay the mortgage, eventually, and sometimes many years later, after living there for free for years or having right. a tenant in there paying you rent, but well, you're not paying the lender for free for three years sometimes, even more, I've heard. Um, you know, the implicit option you have is to just walk away. Okay? Yeah, of course there and, are. And that's what 12 million people did by the way, oh, during yeah. the Great Recession. In 2008, and there are some, there are a lot of states that you can still do that, but there are other states that have changed the laws so that they can now attach other assets that you own to get the money that, that you owe right. them. So the assets they're gonna easily attach right. is bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Absolutely. Those are super easy to attach. Um, in most yeah. states, uh, and you know, I'm not a lawyer, so check with counsel on things, of course. Right. But in most states, uh, what's called purchase money loans on houses, meaning the loan is used to buy the house, right? Um, that those are non-recourse. In uh, uh, when you refinance the property or and, and pull cash out of the property, that becomes a recourse loan where they can go after the borrower. Oh, okay. uh, and that is legally true. However, in practice, they hardly ever do. I mean, wow. I, you know, I hardly <laughs> ever hear a story of, of them going after the borrower. The lenders just want to get out and, you know, sell the property and get what they can and move on well, most of the time. Because they got to do a full-fledged lawsuit to go right. after you like that. It's really hard. Well, I, you know, I agree with a lot, but we're living in unprecedented times and it will be quite interesting to see what happens. And I know we're coming up on our time, but there is one question that I wanted to ask you before we sure. close regarding interest rates, because yep. you mentioned earlier how Volcker pushed interest rates up to control the inflation that was happening as we were transitioning into yep. this debt-based economy. Um, do you think they can push the interest rates up now? Do you think they oh. will push the interest rates up? Of course they can. Well, they can, uh, yes. But, do you think they will? But but will they, you know, I think Paul Volcker, uh, who, who, the late Paul Volcker, is uh, probably the last of the breed of people who uh, really do the right thing. You know, I mean, what he did, he, he suffered just mountains of criticism because it was tough. You know, oh, yeah. he made the country take the tough medicine, but he fixed the problem. Nowadays, nobody has the guts to fix the problem, Lynette. You know, everybody now, it's just, in, we live in an instant gratification world. And, um, you know, any kind of pain and suffering and hardship is just, it's just not acceptable. And you look at the, you know, the, the two newest generations, the millennials and Generation Z, you know, they're not going to be willing to tolerate that kind of thing. I mean, it's just, um, it's just, you know, the, the, the idea of hardship today is someone offending you, you know, that it's like a ridiculous. Okay. I, what, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I would, I would agree with that. However, you know, when we look at that period of time, that was the beginning of the kickoff when, as you said, Nixon, took us off the gold standard and handed yeah. full control of inflation to banks. Yeah. But the problem is, and I, you know, I, I, I could argue, yes, Paul, Paul Volcker um, forced us to take hard medicine. And I lived through that period of time. I had a five year, 15% yeah, so CD. Yeah. You're as old yeah. as I am. Yeah, well, oh. I'm, I, I don't I don't need to be quite as old, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Well, that's true. But, okay. but, you know, I remember my mom had a money market account that paid 16%. Yeah. She used to tell me about that, you know? Yeah. 
So but, it's, uh, it's crazy, yeah. But what I'm really, you know, I could see that that part of what he did was give the central bank ramp room inside of this because during every crisis, here's the problem, during every crisis, they would drop interest rates about five and a half, five and three quarters percent. And then that would get everybody borrowing and spending again and keeping the party going. But right. they're out of that. Th th this is really what the problem is. They're out of that tool. They mm -hmm. can't drop yeah, interest rates five. They can't drop you're, them 3%. You're absolutely you know? right. Can't so, drop them 2%. We're in negative, so, you know, we're already at negative real rates. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In real terms, money is, they're paying you to borrow it. So borrow as much as you can on attached to assets, uh, on fixed rate loans, not consumer borrowing, not credit card debt, none of that. Right. Okay, just borrowing against good assets. That's where you should borrow, like the big companies. And Lynette, before we wrap it up, I really do want to show you one last chart real please. quickly because you're going to like this one, okay? Okay, uh, And we, you Yeah, know, you only get to show them if I like them. Okay. <laughs> well, if <laughs> you don't like kidding. it, your listeners will like it, okay? Okay. So, um, <laughs> Remember we talked not only about the price of the house compared to gold and other commodities, mm -hmm. but how about the mortgage payment on the house? And here it is, okay? So back in 1970, and I'm just gonna talk about gold here only, okay? I mean, barrels of oil are right next to it on the chart and orange juice is right over here. But in gold, if you wanted to pay your mortgage payment in 1970, five decades ago, it would cost you 4.1 ounces of gold to pay your mortgage each month. So, for example, uh, you know, a lot of people were buying Krugerrands in the 70s, okay? And they were putting them in safe deposit boxes and they'd drill a hole in them and wear them around their neck, right? And, you know, people were gold crazy in the 70s for good reason. Right. <laughs> the dollar right. was being debased. Right. Okay. And, and so um, it would cost you 4.1 ounces of gold to pay your mortgage back then. And by 1980, it only cost point nine ounces to pay your mortgage, less than an ounce, less than one fourth of what it cost 10 years earlier. Uh, yet in dollars, it looked more expensive, but in gold, it was cheaper. Now today, as of June of this year, it's only 0.7 ounces of gold to pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So in 51 years, your mortgage payment has been cut by more than three quarters. I mean, from 4.1 ounces to 0.7 ounces to pay your mortgage now. So it is an incredibly good time to be a borrower. And, um, you know, there's one other thing that I think is kind of interesting. Maybe we can talk about it on another show. But you talk a lot on your show about how they are controlling us and want to control the economy and, and inflation and so forth. You know, it's this aspect of how the government has a big incentive to break people up and destroy marriages and get people divorced or keep them single. And I've studied this a lot. And if you think about it, Lynette, if, if, you're, a, if you're one of the big corporate companies, like a consumer goods company, and you want to double your market share, and if, if at the time, it's say the mid-70s, and most of the population, most of the adult population is married. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to produce movies and films and promote feminism and promote people breaking up and splitting up because you go from two toasters or from one toaster in one house to mm -hmm. two toasters. You go from one house to two houses, from two, one sofa to two sofas, from one bed to two beds, right? And you literally double the size of your market share. And if you want to increase the workforce, uh, you just get the other half of the population becoming slaves to corporations. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you've increased the size of the economy. But like you said about the Fed with these artificially low interest rates, they've now used those bullets in the gun. Yep. Okay? There isn't another half of the economy they can put to work now or get to buy a second home. Uh, or a second toaster or a second coffee maker or a second refrigerator, right? That's already done. Marriage, marriage sadly, has become very unpopular. And um, even if people do get married, they mostly split up. Uh, and so that's another way that they are artificially juicing the economy. 
just like with low interest rates. And I think it's a fascinating topic too. That is a very fascinating topic. And we, and we have watched that, you know, over the years, the destruction of the family and the hub. And I'm really glad yeah. you brought that up. It's, it's awful. I mean, where do you think all this stuff comes from of, you know, uh, women empowerment, right? And I'm not saying women shouldn't have every choice they want to make in life. Of course they should, you know, they should be empowered. Everybody but, should. Yeah, everybody should be empowered. In fact, right. look, my company's called Empowered Investor. That's the name of it. It's the sign behind me. Okay. And, but, you know, it, it's just, it, this narrative is, is really a divisive narrative. Okay. And it is splitting people up and look at, don't, don't trust me. The data is there. Okay. Yes. You know, divorce lawyers are making a fortune and, and the wedding business has gone down. Okay. <laughs> and, and everybody needs two of everything now because they got two households instead of one. Yeah. Although in the wedding business, since since Megan is so big a part of that, the cost of a wedding has exploded. Oh. The destination weddings, the destination parties. I, I mean, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. You know, these young couples, I mean, you know, it's fine for older people that have more money, but for young couples, you know, just get a down payment on a house or something, you know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we've covered a lot of stuff, yeah. but I want you to, you know, definitely promote yourself and anything else that you feel that we need to be aware of before we close this really great discussion. Yeah, thank you. So I got a couple, I got a great resource for your listeners. Um, I have a little mini book that is totally free and it's at pandemicinvesting.com. And it's a lot of my techniques that I've been teaching for the last 18 years or so, but um sort of modified for the pandemic environment. And that uh, URL right. is really easy, pandemicinvesting.com. Uh, and then my main website is jasonhartman.com. And, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to help everybody. We do free portfolio makeovers and we'll help them allocate their assets to their highest and best use. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the past 18 years. So I appreciate you having me on. Of course, I'm on YouTube like you are, a much smaller fish than you are on YouTube. <laughs> well, um, I, you know. Um, you know, you, you've got a you great swim following. really yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've, you've done a fantastic job with it. And, uh, and of course, I have my podcast, the Creating mm -hmm. Wealth podcast, and then my YouTube channel. Just look up Jason Hartman and you'll find it. Absolutely. But all the links are also below and they're also on our blog. So we make it easy to get a hold of this very brilliant man. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on. And that's that's it for today, but I know you enjoyed this. You, you guys might want to listen to this, uh, this Coffee with Lynette twice. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye. Happy investing. Thanks, Lynette. Oh, thank you.